well. Well, January was an month. What? What is that? It, we, uh, technically, it was a month. I don't know what January was an month. And I don't even remember what I wanted to say there. So I guess it's just, you know, if I said that with a British accent, maybe. Well, January was an month. Or, or southern pastors are always better, right? I don't even know how to do it with southern accent. That's, you know, that's not going to get better. It just, it, if you just work on it more, it's still not going to be any good. So. So January was a month. Moving on to February, we, uh, to get the narrative of Scripture, you don't just hop around to different stories here. We took five and a half years going through the Old Testament slowly. And then I wanted to jump into the New Testament, but you know what we did? We took a whole year to go through Genesis again all the way to Revelation so we could see the big picture, the meta-narrative, the flow of God's story from beginning to end. And then last year we started in, in, uh, in Matthew, and we've been going so fast and Last week, we covered two verses in Matthew, and we're all the way up to Matthew chapter 19. So if the Lord doesn't come back, we're going to be in the New Testament for some time to come. And, you know, I like that better. Sometimes we do, we like, we talk about raising children. We, talk, we, we go to just a few topical, what they call a topical study, and I think that's, that's really important to do sometimes. Sometimes something happens in the world, and I've got to say, well, look at all of through the Bible. Here's what it says about this topic. But... We go through, we go through bit by bit so that the word of God can preach to us and we're not guilty of just picking and choosing the verses we want to talk about. We let the scriptures flow as they were written. Well, uh, we're going through the New Testament and it so happened that the chapters in Matthew today, uh, the chapters in Matthew for this year in January, they had to do with family and with children and with marriage and, and that's fun. And God loves children. And I got to say that uh, several weeks in a row. Children are highly valued in God's eyes. And, and if society does, looks down at these little guys or doesn't give them enough value, well, then they're out of whack with God. Uh, in val- and marriage is so important to God. God is the one who joins. Let, if God has joined them together, let no man separate them. God is a matchmaker. God likes this whole boys and girls love each other. And God wants boys and girls to look in each other's eyes and say, I'm not going to leave you because life gets hard. I'm not going to leave you because I get irritated with you. We're in this for life. We're together because this is love. When you run away too quick, you never get to experience what love is. Love is all about forgiveness and and learning patience and and learning to stay on through, through the good times and the bad times. God is a matchmaker. God puts people in intimate unions and he says, go have sex and and be united in your spirit and, and love one another and, and work on these things like forgiveness and peace and patience and mercy. We're supposed to weather difficult times and hard times. We're not supposed to leave. Marriage is forever. Today, we're going to study a very troubling and very, very difficult passage. And I don't understand it, <laughs> and yet I'm going to preach on it. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to preach about the parts that I do get, and I'm just going to not talk about the parts that I don't get. Uh, It's about salvation. But the topic today, the name of the sermon today is An Inconvenient and Demanding God. Welcome to Foundation Bible Church. We've got an inconvenient and demanding God. And if you've got the real God, you've got an inconvenient and demanding God too. In fact, a God you can put in your pocket and you can tame and you can tell him what to do uh, that ain't God. God, who does he think he is? He thinks he's God, and God calls the shots. God is, is inconvenient, and he is demanding, and he thinks he knows best. That's the way it is. Uh, we're going to talk about salvation today. What is salvation? Sometimes people say, I don't need to be saved from anything. I don't need to be saved from anything. Well, I want you to look at your life. When I look at my life, and I see the how I can be such a bonehead, how I can be so, I can be such an idiot sometimes. I can be so hard on people. I can hold on to bitterness. I want to hold on to the cross. I want to hold on to love. And yet I, I can let bitterness fester a little bit. I, I can pout with the best of them. I can feel sorry for myself. I can waste time when I should be loving people with feeling miserable. Anybody in here have a problem with being a good complainer? You know, the things you want to be good at, Complaining is not one of them. 
There's, there's, heaven doesn't look down and say, oh, I'm so proud of little Johnny. He's a good forgiver. I'm so proud of little Danny. Look at him. Uh, you know, forgiver would be good. He's a good complainer would be bad. Look at Danny. He knows how to complain. You don't need the Holy Spirit to pout, complain, and feel sorry for yourself. You don't need God to be able to do all that. Salvation from what? Sin. What's sin? Sin is when you, sin is whatever's contrary to the will of God. I mean, that's a theological definition. And, and so people say, well, then, then God just arbitrarily says this is right, this is wrong. No, the Bible says God is love. Moral truth flows from the character of God. He doesn't contradict himself. When, when we sin, what does that mean? It means we're turning our back on goodness, turning our back on moral truth. It means we're, we're rejecting God, God's will for our life. What is sin? Sin is saying and doing things that hurt ourselves and other people, even the people we love most. You know if there was no sin, you would never have that sharp word for your husband or your wife? You know if there was no sin, not one friendship would ever be broken. They're saying, I'm not going to talk to that person again. Sin messes up everything good. Sin kills hope. Sin kills love. Sin kills peace in a relationship. Sin is nasty and ugly, and it's like cancer, and God hates it. And God wants it out of us. So salvation is when I come before God and say, Lord God, I try to be the best person I can, and I'm so messed up. I do things I don't want to do. I say things I don't want to say. I hurt the people around me. Lord God, save me. Save me. I need to be saved for myself. And, and what about death? Here I am, all this information, and in, in just you go this, this thin skull, and you've got a brain in there, and it holds all these memories and all your hopes and all your dreams, and all you need is a car accident. All you need is a, little, a few cells to start replicating themselves incorrectly, and they start rapidly replicating themselves. We call that cancer, and it grows and grows. Or, or you, this thing, boom, boom, since the day you're born, and then one day it starts going, then it locks up on you. Oh, that's all it takes. And suddenly all this information, all your hopes and dreams, your loves, all, all it is is, is is just gone. That's death. Lord, save me. God, you're a God that exists in eternity. And your word says you love us, and you came to die for our sins. You've opened up heaven's doors. Do you know the gates to heaven are not locked? Anybody can go there who wants. You know the people that aren't going to go there? The people who don't want to have anything to do with God. The people who say, no, I'm going to do it my way. The people who hear God's offer and say, I'm going to go my own direction. The gates of heaven were opened by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, and anybody can go. Anybody. And so I say, God, save me. I'm a mess. I need salvation. And Jesus said, that's why I died. And Jesus said, I didn't come to, to save perfect people. I didn't come to, see, to heal this, the, the well because there is nobody who's well. We're all spiritually broken. We all need forgiveness. That's what the cross is about. If you could get to heaven on your own, there would be no cross, right? Why would Jesus have gone through that? So today's message is about salvation. If you are a Christian, a long-term Christian, and you think, how could God love me? I mess up so many ways. I want to remind you, Jesus died for you when you turned, when you had, when you, he was your enemy, when you didn't care about him at all. Now that you've given him your heart, you think he's going to throw that in the trash heap? You think he's going to throw you away just because you mess up? Jesus is the groom, the church is the bride. Jesus does not divorce the bride. If you're a Christian, he's not going to divorce you. He's not going to leave you. That's not the way God operates. If you're really not sure if you're saved yet, or say, well, I went to church when I was little, or I, I said this prayer a long time ago, God forgive me, I don't really know if I'm saved or not. Here's the good news. Jesus is right here, and he's waiting. And all you have to do is open up your heart and say, God, forgive me. I want to follow you. I'm going to be your person. I want to follow you from today. And God, he's so good, he's not going to say, not you, or heck with you. He's not, there's not anybody who's legitimately come to God and say, Lord, God, forgive me. Please. Let me in. And he turns his back on you. He will not do that. So wherever you're at today, remember, your relationship with God is not based on your goodness. We don't have any. It's based on his goodness. He loves us. He will forgive us. And everybody can come to Jesus who wants to. The gates of heaven are wide open.
come to Jesus. So there's a lot in this passage today that I don't understand. I do know that when Christians read about this difficult event, when pastors teach on it, that sometimes we fall into a trap. And the trap is we spend most of our time and effort making Christ's words seem less hard than they appear. Brothers and sisters, if we're sharing the words of Jesus, and most of our time is spent trying to say, oh, Jesus didn't really mean what it sounded like he meant, there's something wrong there. At, at, I want us at a minimum today not to minimize Christ's words. Don't hear it and immediately say, whoa, 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 he didn't really mean that. Let's let Christ speak for himself. I, I said this before, I'm not Christ's PR man. Jesus has all these difficult things. Uh, if you want to follow after me, uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow after me. And I put my hand on his mouth and say, no, he didn't really mean that. Try to make it easy for everybody. I'm not his PR man. It's not my job to make Christ's words less offensive. Jesus Christ is offensive. The cross is offensive. The cross says, you're a screw-up. Get on your knees and repent. If, if I wasn't a screw-up, there would be no cross. If we were all fine in ourselves, there would be no cross. The cross says, we need Jesus. We need his blood. We need his sacrifice to cover our sins. Jesus is, by nature, offensive. Because the cross says, we can't make it on our own. All of us, all of us, if God in flesh wanted to shock and offend our sensibilities, I'm going to say, I guess he knows best. Okay, please turn to Matthew chapter 19, 16 through 26. <clears throat> this passage is often called the rich young ruler. This guy, we don't know his name, but he's rich. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Isn't that a great question? What do I have to do to get eternal life? So he says, what good thing? He, he says, there must be something I can do, some good deed I can do in order to get eternal life. And Jesus says, why do you ask me about what's good? There is only one who is good, that's God. If you want to enter, enter eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? Isn't that a funny answer? Jesus tells him, if you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. His response was, which ones? Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I've kept. The young man says, what do I still lack? Well, we know when, from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he explained these, remember? He said, murder, if you've ever hated somebody, just wanted to. In your heart, you're guilty of murder in God's eyes. You murdered them in your heart. If you ever lusted after a girl, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. All these things. In other words, Jesus is trying to show us none of us measure up. None of us are good. There is only one who is good. If you want to be the hero, you're trying to take Jesus' place. If you want to be the king, you're trying to sit in God's chair. If you want to walk around and talk about how good you are, well, you're crazy. <laughs> Only God is good. All these I've kept, that was easy for him because he's not thinking. The young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered him, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, maybe your version says, go and sell your possessions. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, I'll tell you what, Jesus knew exactly which button to push. Jesus was trying to get him to think. He needed this man to define his relationship with him. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it's hard. It's so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, 
They were greatly astonished and asked, well, if rich people aren't going to heaven, who can be saved? Because cultures tend to think, well, rich people got their acts all together. Jesus looked at them and said, with human beings, salvation, listen, it's impossible. With human beings, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. See, this guy says, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? Jesus pushed the right buttons to reveal to him. First, first Jesus says, there's only one who's good, and you ain't him. And then he says, well, I can do all that. I've done all that. Jesus says, what about this? And the guy goes away sad. Jesus turns around and says, look it, look it. And the people and his disciples said, well, if he can't be saved, how can he be saved? And Jesus said, that's the point. With human beings, salvation is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Peter answered him and said, hey, uh, we've left everything to follow you. So he's kind of doing the same thing that the rich young guy did. Look at me. I'm obeying all the rules. And Peter says, oh, okay, forget about that impossible stuff and we're not good stuff. Uh, we left everything. We just, you told him to leave stuff. We left stuff. What then will be left for us? What are we going to get? Isn't that great? Isn't that sad? Isn't that the way we usually do religion? God, what am I going to get out of it? <laughs> okay, I'll pray, but what am I going to get out of it? God, you're going to give me a bigger house, bigger car, bigger wife? God, what am I going to get out of it? I got that one from my Uncle Dan. <laughs> it was too good to, left unsaid, to be left unsaid. We've left everything to follow you. What are we going to get out of it? Jesus said, truly, I tell you, and listen to this mercy and love. At the renewal of all things, at the end times, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you will have followed me. You who have followed me will also sit at the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a 100 times as much and will inherit eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and those who are last shall be first. Well, I went farther than I intended to go. Everyone who has left houses, well, Jesus would never ask you to leave your house. He wants you to be happy. Anybody who's lost a brother or sister or a father or mother or a wife for his sake, oh, Jesus, that couldn't be his will, could it? Or children or fields for my sake, you're going to get back a lot more from God going to get back a lot more. Confusing passage. Jesus was pressing this man, pressing this point in his life to see that his wealth meant more to him than following God. He thought he had it all together. And Jesus is asking him to do this because he knows it's going to unravel his faith in himself. The book that we're using in the adult Sunday school class is called Not a Fan, and it deals quite a bit with this story of the rich young ruler and uh, Kyle Eidelman, which I don't know if that means like he's lazy or that he worships idols, but anyways, it's idol man. The writer makes this insightful observation. Please listen to this. It's, it's a long quote. It's hard to pay attention during quotes. Pay attention. Jesus invites the man, this rich young ruler, to become his follower. But first, the man is told to sell all his possessions and give to the poor. He's faced with the choice of following Jesus or keeping his stuff. But he couldn't do both. There was no way to follow Jesus without denying himself. Many people want to make this story about money, but it's not so much about money as it is about following Jesus. Jesus puts this man at a crossroads. You see that? Jesus put this man at a crossroads where he had to make a choice. He can follow the path that leads to money, or he can follow Jesus, but he can't do both. So what does all this mean for you and me? Is selling everything a requirement to follow Jesus? And right now we're all thinking, what, 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 please say no. Well, it may be. Okay, at least he didn't say it had to be. In fact, I would say the more defensive you are of Jesus' words to this man, the more likely it is that Jesus might be saying them to you as well. If Jesus was here today and you were to say, now, explain this passage to me so I don't have to give away my money. Jesus would probably say these very words to us. Money's got too much of a hold on your heart. Your career has too much of a hold on your heart. This relationship that you know is wrong, you're not willing to give it up for me, are you? And Jesus knows the button to push. What is true is that everyone who follows Jesus will find himself or herself at a similar crossroads as this man in Matthew 19. 
What about ministry? I mean, that's a good thing, right, ministry? What if, what if ministry, like a, a business ministry, like building a bigger church, getting more people, what if that means more to me than uh, loving God and loving other people? Well, then I wonder if Christ would say, Dan, you want to really follow me? Give up ministry. What if, what if uh, I come and I, oh God, I'm doing good things and I'm, I'm fighting against abortion and the homosexual agenda and I'm, I'm really into politics and I need to... And God says, where's your love? I've got to follow this. He says, are you willing to let that go? Now, is ministry a bad thing? Is family a bad thing? All these things are good things, right? Money is not inherently bad. The love of money, when we're putting it before God, is the root of all evil. What if, what if I've got an agenda? In, in my agenda is, is I need to make a... a I need to make Toll House cookies uh, desirable to everybody's home. And so I, I'm tired of people being prejudicial and just choosing Pillsbury all the time. And, and, and my whole life is about building up. And Jesus is going to say to me, Dan, those cookies, they're God to you. They're taking my place. That's a, that was flippant. I don't want to make this easy, and I don't want to make this too funny. What is the idol? What is it in our life? that we're honoring and putting ahead of God. So that with the choices we make are more about maybe the vacation home I want to get. The choices I make are maybe more about keeping me happy and fat and well, whatever. Right now I'm hoping the Holy Spirit's talking because I can't think of an illustration for every single person in this room but what might it be in your life that's keeping you from following Jesus? Job, career, security? Put Jesus first. Jesus wants to be first in your life. He loves you so much he died for you. He wants to be your first love. He wants to be your consuming love. He wants to be everything to you. And we say, yes, but I've got this. Uh, I was thinking, you know how to build a big church? There's a way to build a big church. I could really make our church about conservative politics, and, and I could really make that our passion. And you know what I could do? Everybody who agrees with me would start saying, yeah, let's well, come here, and we can look down at other people and feel so good about ourselves, and we could build up a big church that's all about building ourselves up and looking down at other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, part of me feels that way too. And, and you know what? Jesus would say, you guys don't even have me. I'm going to take away that lampstand. No. Oh, by the way, what if my church is, is uh, liberal? And, and boy, I just have to make sure that, that uh, gays and lesbians are affirmed and we don't ever want to say, thou shalt not. We don't ever want to tell people that that's sin because we just want to fit in and feel good and go with the flow. And God would say, where am I? Get on your knees. I don't care if you're liberal, you're conservative. What, the rich young ruler had to give up his money. What do we have to give up to fall on our knees before holy God and say, I want you, and I don't want to be distracted by anything in this world? There are so many things that we fall for. And I don't, you know what, we think some left wing, right wing, we... Okay, this is right. Right wing, left wing. We, we think these things are so important. And I think the devil's sitting back there and saying, I don't care what laws you get passed. Come to me, baby. But if one person says, Lord, I'm so, I've made so many things. I've done so many things. Forgive me. I want to be with you. And I want to be a person of love and forgiveness. And I want to give my life that's one person who's going to be in eternity with God. That changes everything. And one person becomes another and becomes another. And I don't care what they do in Washington, D.C. If hundreds and thousands and millions of people start turning their life over to Jesus, everything gets better, regardless of what they do. What are we putting first? Uh, I was sharing in, in the Sunday school this morning that when I was a, a younger pastor and, and missionary, I did some things that I'm ashamed of. I did a lot of things I'm ashamed of now. 
But in the context of this sermon, uh, there was a fella who was coming to my Bible studies, and he was a businessman. And he was a wonderful guy. I loved him, but the pastor and his wife told me, don't believe a word he says. He's a liar, and he was a liar. He always came red-faced and reeking of alcohol. You know, uh, he stuttered. His handshake was like a, a limp fish, you know. In uh, and, and, and everything he said to me is a lie. But I could tell sometimes when I share the gospel with him, we're going through the Bible, he'd, he'd get teary eyes and start to hit him. But next week he'd be, you know, he did that Holy Spirit dodge, you know. <laughs> that was close. I almost had to become a Christian. But he, he thankfully got out of the way of that. And, but one day he and I prayed together and he was teary eyed. He said, this is real, isn't it? I said, yeah, it's real. He was so excited, he started coming to church. And I couldn't believe it. His face was no longer red. He gave you a firm handshake, he looked in the eye, and his stuttering went away. Now, that's not the way it always works. I've known good Christian people that stutter, so please don't misunderstand. For whatever reason, this guy stopped stuttering when he came to Jesus. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. He gave you a firm handshake. He'd listen to the sermons, and he'd get tears in his eyes. He got baptized, and I'm saying, you got to bring your wife. you got to bring your wife. No, no, she won't take it. you got to bring your wife. And he's, one day after his message, he said, i got to bring my wife. I want her to be in heaven with me. He didn't come to church the following week. He did. I got a knock at my door. I opened it up, and there he is, red-faced, smelling of alcohol. Can't look me in the eye, and he says, I'm so sorry. He's laughing. My wife says she's going to leave me if I go to church, so I, I can't go to church anymore. And as a young pastor, instead of going out after the, the one sheep, instead of fighting for his soul, I told him something that's technically true. I said, I said you know what? You don't have to be at church to be a Christian. That's true, right? That's true. It's out of God's will. That's not where he should be. The Bible says if an unbelieving spouse won't put up with you, let him go. But you know what I told him to do? With, won't put up with you going to church, living for Jesus to let him go. You know what I told him to do? I said, don't, don't, don't put your marriage in danger. You know, just keep following Jesus. I never saw him again. I dropped the ball. I failed as his Christian brother. I should have fought for him. Because Jesus said, come and deny yourself. And I'm saying, no, 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 don't deny yourself. Jesus, says, G- Jesus said, whatever's getting in the way of your life or whatever's getting in the way of you honoring me, let it go. And I told him, no, 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 you can't let that go. When I was a younger pastor, people would come up to me all the time and say, I got I to gotta work on Sunday because it's time and a half. I got to work on Sunday because I can make more money. And I don't, I don't want us to be legalistic. We're not going to be talking about firemen and policemen and doctors on call and all that kind of stuff. But I've changed because I've seen what not going to church does in people's lives. And now when people come to me and say, I can make a few extra bucks working Sunday, i got to do it. I say, no, you don't. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Be here. Be with the Lord's people. Let your life change. In, uh, I was guilty of Jesus, Jesus, giving inconvenient and demanding truth. And I turned around and tried to make it. Like I'm supposed to translate for him. He says something hard and I'm going to make it easy. God forbid. I just th- I'm just thankful that God was patient with me. I was wrong. Colossians 3.5 says that the love of money is like idol worship. Well, I don't have any statues in my house. I'm not burning incense and bowing down. Well, the love of money is idolatry, and it must be put to death. Now, that was not Dan. That's not Pastor Dan. Colossians 3, 5, the love of money is idolatry and must be put to death. God looks down from heaven and says, that's got to die in you because you're not giving your heart fully to me. This is an idol in your heart. One way that God has chosen to illustrate our relationship to him is marriage. A marriage between a man and a wife looks like our, mar- our relationship between Jesus and the church. It's marriage. Jesus is called the groom, and all true Christians collectively are known as the bride. When you ask somebody to marry you, the implication is that you leave behind all the other lovers that you might have. Jesus, I want to follow you. 
and I've got money and career and all these other things that I'm going to put before you. Try that on, on a gal when you propose to her. I love you. I want, to I, I want to be with you the rest of my life. But there's some other girls that I'm going to be putting first. Do you think that's going to work? How, is that, how does that sound in heaven when I say, I love you, Jesus, but hands off my wallet? I love you, Jesus, but don't talk to me about my, my, my whatever it is, my goals, my plans, because they're mine. Christ is basically telling the rich young man, you don't really want me. You want your money more than me. <coughs> Come follow me, but I can see another lover has your heart. Come follow me, but I can see you're not ready to commit yourself to me. You're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to let it go if you truly want me, if you're truly going to follow me. And by the way, when Jesus said, come follow me, where was he going? The cross. He knew where he was going. Follow me to the cross. Radical self-denial, radical love, sacrifice in order to be a blessing to other people. Jesus is not calling us to a life of comfort and ease. Jesus is saying, I want you to forgive that person. And God, you say, God, that'll hurt too much. And he says, crucify yourself. Love that person the way I love them. And, and you say, God, this is who I am. And God says, are you going to love me enough to let that go? What is it in our life that's keeping us from falling down at the foot of the cross? Radical self-denial, learning to love God, learning to love other people, even when we're not going to get anything out of it. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful when love is like that? This is hard stuff. This is not lollipop Christianity. This is not white picket fence Christianity. This is, this is, this is not precious moments Christianity. This is not angels with chubby cheeks Christianity. This is bloody cross Christianity that says love even when it hurts. Care about other people even when it's not convenient. Put God first in all things. Uh, sometimes we come to church and we get so happy, snappy, you know, and it's like I push a button and uh, just light up and it's all fake. And, and Oswald Chambers said, No enthusiasm will ever stand the strain that Jesus Christ will put upon his worker. What? Only one thing will, and that is a personal relationship to him which has gone through the mill of his spring cleaning until there's only one purpose left. I am here for God to send me where he will. Brothers and sisters, in your heart, I want you right now to say, I'm here for God. Let him send me where he will. Remember when, when the angel came to Mary? And of course she was scared. You know, he said, be not afraid. And she tells her, you're going you're gonna to have a child out of wedlock, you know, People are going to wonder. People are going to ask questions. You're just a young gal. It's going to be God. <laughs> it's going to be God incarnate. It's going to be hard. And she said, I'm the Lord's maidservant. Let it be done unto me as you have said. Remember Jesus in the, in the garden before he goes to the cross? He says, God, if there's any way to win salvation for the people, please take this cup from me. I don't want to. And, and he's sweating. Tear drops of blood. And he's... He's in anguish. He keeps praying. He goes back to his disciples. What are they doing? He says, please pray with me. They're all sleeping. They're snoring. They're curled up. He said, can't you guys even pray with me for one hour? He goes back and prays. And, and then he finally says, God, not my will, but your will be done. God, Father, whatever you want me to do, I'll go where you want me to go. Send me where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. One of the speakers at the No Regrets Conference said something like this. The church used to be a lifeboat saving folks. Now it's a luxury liner trying to entertain folks. Well, that ain't church. You come to church, and if all you're hearing week after week is building up, and you're so precious, you're so wonderful, you don't need to change a thing, you're so cute. That ain't church. If church is just here so we can feel better than other people, I'm religious, therefore I'm better than other people, Jesus apparently missed the memo. <laughs> Jesus doesn't do church that way, does he? In his famous book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, 
Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. <laughs> I don't want to drill the truth or crown it or stop it. I want to have it out. That's why it's called born again. It's a whole new life. Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you completely. I have a question. What do you think Christ wants you to give up? What's standing between you and a deeper relationship with Jesus? You don't have to, you don't have to raise your hand and tell me. I have a second question, though, that might help you answer the first one. What are you afraid Jesus might ask you to give up? Addiction? Popularity? Tough guy image? Career track? What's more important to us than getting right with the Lord? Before we close, I want to really make sure that we're all on the same page here. Uh, if you think Jesus is teaching that no one should have any possessions, if that's what it's all about, or if, if that you want to get to heaven, you have to give away all your stuff, then you really missed the whole point today. You really missed the whole point. Jesus is asking, what do you love more than me? And for that man, it was money, dirty, filthy money. And Jesus pushed that button because he knew that was this barrier to Christ. What gets in the way of my service to God? What keeps me from loving God? What keeps me from loving you guys the way I should? What keeps us from loving each other as we should? What's in my heart? Is it pride? Is it a critical nature? What is it that we're putting ahead of God in our lives? Because there is nothing that we should love or prioritize over Jesus. Amen? <coughs> as Christians, we're called to be radically, completely, utterly devoted to God, to love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, Christ is very demanding because that's the way love is. Husband and wife, they should have each other. There should not be anybody else in the picture. Jesus says, this is between you and me. I want everything. He interferes with our plans because he thinks he's God. He's inconvenient, and he is love incarnate, and he promises joy, peace, forgiveness, and eternal life if we would pursue him. Pursue a relationship with him. Brothers and sisters, heaven's a real place. God's a real God. He's calling us to put away all that sin and darkness and selfishness in our lives to live good lives, live good lives of truth and, and nobility and honor and goodness and forgiveness and mercy and compassion. And we're, we're called to follow Jesus in everything, even if he takes us to hard places, even if we have to pick up a cross and endure things we don't want to pick up, endure things we don't want to carry. We've got a good God, and he loves us too much to keep us in the mess we're already in. He's calling us out. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you love us enough to say hard things to us. Lord, please uh, send your Holy Spirit to each one of us. Help us not to argue with you or be defensive. You say if money is an idol in our heart that it has to die, Lord, show us what has to die. What addiction, Lord? What, what selfish, what grudge? What are we holding on to, Lord, that keeps us from you? Father, I pray that we can sing to you, that we can pray to you, that we can read your Bible, that we can worship you with everything inside of us, that we can love you and put you first with everything we are, Lord, with our strength and with our mind, with our soul, with everything we are, Lord. God, thank you for being good to us. Help us to be good to one another. And help us to follow you all the way, all in, no regrets. Pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.